Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today we're going to talk about public bath houses and comfort stations. And I am really excited because we're going to combine things that were happening 100 years ago with things that are happening literally today. Although actually maybe not literally today because it's raining, but pretty close to today. So let's start with bath houses. Um, public bath houses began in the United States in the 1840s, the years before the Civil War, as immigration was on the rise and cities were swelling. And, uh, and the city planners uh, made a connection between hygiene and public health, um, especially to stop the prevention, stop the spread of disease. Um, I was trying to think today, can you imagine trying to stop the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, by cramming a bunch of people in a public bathhouse, hot and steamy, close together? Um, but anyway, that's what they were doing back then. In Baltimore, we were a little late to the game. We didn't get our bathhouses started until the 1890s. Um, and the first one was by the Canton Congregational Church in Canton um, in the 1890s. Um, and they, they uh, started a bathhouse, one for men, one side for men, one side for women. And that caught the attention of Mayor uh, Ferdinand Latrobe. Latrobe was the great city building mayor, did all sorts of things. Um, and he formed the Free Public Bath Commission to try to see if we could get some public bathhouses in Baltimore. But Baltimore being Baltimore, we did not go the route of other cities, which simply used municipal funds to erect bathhouses and run them. Um, we sought private, uh, uh, sort of a private partner, a, uh, a sponsor, if you will. And we found one in a gentleman who was living in New York. He was a railroad tycoon, very wealthy. He inherited a lot of money from his father um, and only uh, compounded it over time. Um, and that gentleman's name was Henry Walters. And of course, he was part of the father-son art collecting duo, uh, William Walters and his son, Henry. So Henry apparently had returned from a trip uh, to Egypt and became convinced of the connection between public health and public baths there um, and was eager to help out in Baltimore, his hometown. Um, and he, uh, he, with his money, the city erected the first public bathhouse in 1900 um, on High Street in Little Italy. Uh, Walters paid $15,000 for that. Um, and he said it, he's willing to do more. And in fact, over time, he erected public bathhouse number two uh, in, uh, on Washington Boulevard in Pigtown. Public bathhouse number one, uh, you could take a bath for free, uh, but if you wanted soap, that would cost you three and a half cents. By uh, public bath number two, 1902, I believe, so two years later, uh, soap was, uh, was five cents a bar. Um, and Walters had a couple, uh, when he was giving his money, he had a couple stipulations. One is that the bathhouses have his name on them, which they all did. Um, and number two is that the city would run them. He didn't want to have anything to do with running them. Um, so bathhouse number two was erected. Um, he went on to create five in total. Uh, but in bathhouse number two, they had apparently learned some lessons. And there were signs on the wall that said, um, no smoking, um, no shaving. Uh, and apparently one of the th problems was that people were pilfering the towel. So there was a sign that also said uh, you'd be prosecuted if you took your towels. Um, but in addition to a bath and soap, you could also do your laundry for something like three and a half cents an hour. So the bathhouses became quite popular. By the 1930s, there were uh, somewhat of over 600,000 people a year using Baltimore City's public bathhouses. Today, unfortunately, Walter's bathhouse number two is the only one that remains. Uh, but luckily, and uh, for all of us, it's now been converted into apartments and it's doing just fine. Um, the Public Bath Commission uh, uh, went on to do other things. They had a showers and schools program and they oversaw the city's uh, municipal pools as well. Uh, but the bathhouses only lasted until 1959. And let me read you a quote from a gentleman who emerged from Public Bath Number 2 on Washington Boulevard at 445, according to the Baltimore Sun. Um, he was the last bather to use Baltimore's uh, public baths. The city was going through what they called an austerity program, and that's what shut him down. Uh, but here's what this bather had to say about the closing. He said, I say nothing doing. Let them cut down the big shots who have chauffeurs if they want to save money. Why hurt poor people who have, who have nowhere else to get a bath? It's the handiest thing that ever was. So that was the last, uh, those were the last words for Baltimore City's uh, public bathhouses. But the other thing the Public Bath Commission did was oversee comfort stations. And we're going to turn now to the Lafayette Square comfort station. Um, Lafayette Square was, if you, if you know where it is, it's uh, on Lafayette. If you're in Bolton Hill or you're at Micah, just keep going on Lafayette, cross over Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, in just a few blocks, you'll be there. It's a fantastic place. It got its start in the 1850s. Um, it was a place where Baltimoreans would 
escape from sort of all of the density of downtown Baltimore and, and go retreat to the hills. Um, it was known for its great, magnificent oak trees. Um, and that, of course, attracted real estate developers. And in the 1850s, the Lafayette Square Company formed to develop houses uh, in what was formerly uh, uh, fields and forests. Um, the Civil War put a kink in that, and uh, it was used, the square was used as an army hospital, a thousand uh, people, uh, Union Army Hospital was there at the time. But after the Civil War ended, the Lafayette Square Company uh, got up and running again, and they did develop, uh, um, did develop a neighborhood. Um, they created a public square. They lured the uh, Episcopal Church of the Assumption from downtown by giving it a free lot on the square. What a better way to start a real estate development. And uh, uh, fairly quickly after that, not, not one, but four churches located on Lafayette Square. It was known as Church Square. Um, and it was the height of fashion for a while. In between 1910 and 1930, it underwent a sea change. White residents moved out and new residents brought a new vitality to the square and it again became the height of fashion. If you were an African-American doctor or lawyer or banker, that's where you wanted to live. Um, you had uh, churches nearby, obviously. You had uh, the world-class entertainment district the Pennsylvania Avenue within walking distance. And you had good schools, inc including George Washington Carver Vocational Institute, um, the first uh, school in Maryland to train kids, African-American, American kids in vocational skills. Um, they were housed in a building that was built in 1876, I believe, or 1870s, 1880s, um, for the normal school, the state normal school, which had moved out in the 19 teens. Um, and today we know that as Towson University. So both Towson uh, University and uh, Carver Vocational got their starts in Lafayette Square. Um, but by the 1940s, uh, World War II had ended, and that was a good thing, but it was also a challenging time for cities as people were fleeing to these new things called the suburbs. And we don't know a lot about the history of the Lafayette Square Comfort Station, but it was built in the 1940s um, by uh, Mayor Theodore McKeldin, um, and he built two of them, uh, one in Union Square, which was predominantly white at that time, and one in Lafayette Square that was predominantly black. And the two comfort stations um, are identical. And a comfort station, if you don't know what that is, it's basically restrooms uh, and, and a utility room in between um, so that the folks who are caring for the square or the park uh, have a place to store tools and whatnot. Um, so uh, McKeldin, by the way, was one of the first elected officials to really embrace civil rights efforts. Um, maybe most famously, he stood with the marchers and protesters at Ford's Theater, um, helping to uh, uh, force uh, them to allow all races in. Um, but by the 1970s and 80s, the comfort station in Lafayette Square uh, had uh, become vacant. The city had basically uh, lost funding to keep it up and had shuttered it. Um, and today, I am really pleased that we are part of an effort, uh, along with the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development um, and the Baltimore National Heritage Area, to restore it so that it again can have functioning restrooms and again can have a functioning uh, electrical system so that people can do things like plug in amplifiers for a jazz concert. And I'm going to leave you with this thought. Um, I, when, when we were first undertaking this, I thought, well, what's the value of a comfort station, really? It's kind of a small building. You know, what's it going to do? I have recently learned the value of a comfort station as my family and I have gone on hikes and bike rides in state parks, which are open, uh, but the restrooms are not. And what we intended many times to be a two or three uh, hour outing turns into a 45 minute sprint and then hightailing it back home to try to find a restroom that we can use. So when we're allowed to gather again, Again, um, I will encourage you and invite you to come out with me, maybe six feet apart, uh, but we'll have for sure a celebration of maybe a concert, a jazz concert um, in Lafayette Square. Thanks so much, and we'll see you tomorrow.